her anxiety worse. The fact that she had well, been spied yes. on, the fact that she had been spied on, gave her another panic attack. Okay, all right. But that was it. Was it was not something she was proud of. It was something. It took her a long time to even tell me that. Story. So was this clinically recorded? This uh, the um, was it documented with with what he shared? I mean, is this because it's subjective? Was this documented on record? No, no these, these people were not part. See, the thing is, this is the problem with near-death experiences is these people did not sign up for a study. Mm -hmm. These are normal people, right. and it just happened to them. Mm -hmm. Now, when doctors are going about our business, um, most of the time, they're not going to even going to ask about this stuff because the question is, of what relevance is this to your care? Mm -hmm. You have six broken ribs and a broken arm, mm -hmm. okay? Do we really care about this? Mm -hmm. You know, unless the doctor asks, you're not going to share it, mm -hmm. okay? Now, some people will some people will but he popped out of his body he, he he saw Millie he popped back into his body he didn't get into the tunnel mm -hmm. he didn't make it to the white light he didn't talk to God okay. that was the extent of his experience mm -hmm. many near-death experiences they pop out and pop back in like his mm -hmm. now the, what's interesting about it though is it, again like the other example you know it, 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 well like other examples I should say what it does is it validates that when people have these experiences they are really coming out of their bodies you know, some of these, you know, many of the naturalists claim that it's all in our heads, that mm -hmm. this is a part of the dying brain. Right. As the brain loses oxygen and glucose, it, 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 it starts to die from the outside in. And the last part to go is the visual cortex, giving that feeling of, that, of going into the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And the reason you feel so good is because you've got endorphins moving, because the brain is just, it's dying, and so it's firing randomly, giving rise to all of this feeling. That's, that's utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. When the brain fires randomly, it's called a seizure. Mm -hmm. And you don't remember anything. Right. You lose consciousness mm -hmm. of the seizure. That's not what happens in these cases. And when you take a look at cases like Darlene and Kenneth, look at like what, what happened with Kenneth. Kenneth, you know, I mean, you know, he came out, he saw something that was, he, he recorded a conversation that he could not have been privy to unless he'd really been out of his brain. Mm -hmm. His brain didn't, his brain wasn't, a bit, his, his brain wasn't popped out two miles away. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. Well, this is all subjective, you know, it's, even though it's subjective and uh, these are stories that are true, it's not scientific. So uh, because there's not, um, I, I just, to my understanding that it's not considered scientific and that's why there's not a lot of um, investment put into this with uh, uh, near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences. I mean, the insurances don't pay for it. It doesn't cover it. But it, Why would it, they cover? It's, it's like you've come back, you're alive. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a treatment. <laughs> We're gonna pay to keep you there. You should have yeah. stayed there. <laughs> you know, the care, the Cheaper for us to stay there. The psychological care, the treatment. Uh, well, really, the psych just, well, actually, with, with regard right. to psychological, you know, I mean, I have had uh, a couple patients uh, who psychologically there were ramifications mm -hmm. and, and uh, my, the last case that I had for example was somebody I was treating at Perspectives of Troy mm -hmm. and uh, this is a man who had one of these near-death experiences and once you've seen the other side you don't really want to come back it takes a lot to get you to come back mm -hmm. it's somebody here it's a loved one a spouse a child a parent um, a spouse a child a parent it's mm -hmm. a person usually mm -hmm. it's not usually an issue mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, you hear the same story. If it wasn't for mom, if it wasn't for my husband, if it wasn't for my kids, there was no way I would have come back. Mm -hmm. There was no way. Mm -hmm. There is always better. The, the experience that they have there, uh, universally, in, in my experience, universally, they don't want to come back. Mm -hmm. They beg to stay if they're given a the choice. Mm -hmm. Most of my patients are not given the choice. Now, with regard to scientific, you can't submit that. To, I mean, this is we're talking about something that's on a level. The physics involved is beyond where we're at. All we can do is take a look at these anecdotal cases and say, look, either these people are lying, mm -hmm. or we doctors are lying, or we are misinterpreting something that is really something else. Mm -hmm. Okay, that those are our options. I mean, that for, this is a logical problem. It's not really a wet science problem. This is not something you can easily take into the laboratory. Now, there are studies going on right now, as you know, where they have random number generators and pictures pointed at the ceiling. So when people come out yeah. at various uh, intensive in, in various operating rooms, then they have it, and those those will be concluding in the next few years. You know, so even let's say that they all they're all positive, and we have all these people show up. So then, what does that prove, God? Mm -hmm. It proves right. that, what does that what does that prove? It doesn't tell me any more than I know right now. Right. You know, you can't really, for people who are saying, well, when science proves it, then I'll believe it. So you're going to live without purpose until, the, until, I mean, really? You don't think the evidence right now is really strong? No. When you think about the millions of people, mm -hmm. and not all these people have verifiable experiences such as, uh, such as Darlene's. You know, not all of them have that. But enough of, you hear enough of these stories and you got to think, hey, mm -hmm. 
You know, do you believe that only some people have spirits? Is that what we believe? What are the options? Yeah. Uh, again, the model that I have is, is that, you know, the reason that some people don't is because the brain's like a toaster. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like if, if the electricity is on, right. it holds the bread, which is our spirits. <laughs> mm -hmm. It holds it in there. But when it is sufficiently cut off, and by electricity, I'm not talking about actual electricity, but specifically neuron viability, mm -hmm. when the individual neurons have collectively lost enough of the endogenous nutrients and they st before they start consuming themselves, once it gets to that certain level, it's like they don't have the energy to keep the soul and the biological brain mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And we come popping out. We don't have a choice. People who have these experiences come popping out of their bodies like they don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody tries to ooze out of the body. Right. The next thing you know, they find themselves on the ceiling looking down. Mm -hmm. Is that very common just uh, with um, in cases of people who are terminally ill? I mean, is, this, is there an order in which this happens commonly? Well, I mean, I can, you know, I can say if you want, I can sit here and talk for 12 hours just giving you anecdotal reports of mm -hmm. what happens. Yeah, yeah. Each story is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a lot in common. As far as the orders are concerned, um, when people are terminally ill, uh, sometimes they will lapse into states like this and they mm -hmm. will start seeing both worlds. Mm -hmm. It's not unusual. For example, when my stepfather was dying, three days before he died, he saw his, you know, he reports that he saw his father and he argued with him because mm -hmm. his father was saying, it's your time, and he didn't want to go. And then the next night, his brother came, and he had the same argument, and he was very upset. He was actually crying. My mom kept calling me, you know, your father's going through this. And at the time, I was in my radiology program, and I was convinced it was delirium. And I said, just, you know, tell, tell his doctor about it. He needs to be put on some antipsychotics mm -hmm. because this is clearly delirium. The third night, his, his cousin showed up, and he was closest to his cousin. And um, he finally agreed that it was t he was willing to go after he talked to his cousin. He told my what he told he told my mother. He says, you know, um, call all the kids, have them come by because this is it. I'm, I'm, t I'm you gotta let me know. Let me go when it's time for me to leave. And she called me, and I told him, no, I'm not coming there because you can't know when it's your time. It's right. not possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, this stuff is it's all delirium. Mm -hmm. And of course, he dies you know, yeah, right yeah, then. Yeah. You know, and so I thought about that, but you know, I, I still. You know, I, I didn't quite know what to make of it, you know, yeah. but I, I felt, to this day, I wish I'd gone, you know. Well, I know, but, as, but, as, a, as a hospice nurse for um, seven years, I've cared for uh, uh, patients with end-stage diseases or end-of-care life with both uh, pediatric and adult um, uh, people. And um, there seems to be, during the, uh, the active phase, of, of life, active phase of death, the, the last three to five days, um, usually uh, the experiences are very similar. And um, there's always that near-death experience that uh, they take a last breath and then and many times they would come back and share what happened on the other side. And mm -hmm. then all the family is called in and um, uh, and then they last for another week. I mean, it seemed to be very common, but um, it did uh, have, there was an opportunity for things to get in order. Yeah. And there were, you know, so many different instances where uh, things needed to be shared between family members, and there were unresolved issues between family members, which mm -hmm. is the reason why they stayed around mm -hmm. um, to make peace with the other person who's going to remain. And um, um, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, end stage, end of care life, um, there are a lot. There's got to be a great percentage of near death experiences oh, yeah. just in that account. Well, that's that's, and I don't know if what you, that's you know, what do you call those? Um, you almost need another word for it because some of those aren't actually near death because they don't actually come out of their body. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. just the experiences of being close to yeah, death. Yeah. It's like when it's your time, it's not unusual to get the visitations mm -hmm. from the dead folks, from the relatives and friends that have gone before. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, uh, I remember one gentleman I was taking care of there, and uh, he uh, was the, you know, they wanted to be treated because he kept talking about seeing his wife. And they said, his wife is dead. And he keeps, he's, he's furious at her. And, uh, and I went to interview him, and he was mad because his wife showed up, and he says, I thought you, you let me think you were dead all those years, and here you are just as fine. And he was furious yeah. because he saw her. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I, I didn't think about it in your death experience. I thought the man was delirious. Until I asked further, I found out that all the people that he had seen had been deceased. And I remembered, wait a minute, yeah, there was such a thing as a harbinger sign. In the old medical textbooks, they used to talk about that. When you started seeing dead relatives, that meant your time was about mm -hmm. up. 
So, but then later on, he told me about seeing a friend of his, and he says, you know, not only did my wife show up, but Henry was there, and that really threw me for a loop there. And he says, Henry, I can't believe it. I thought we threw you in the Detroit River, you know, because he actually he he him and a friend had when Henry had died, they had put cement shoes on him because they didn't they didn't have any money to bury him. So mm -hmm. they put him in the Detroit River, mm -hmm. and then there he was again. It was like, surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was dead within a month of that. Wow. So, he had, so usually when people have these experiences of people coming back, sometimes it's delirium. And so that's why when, people, when yeah. people are delirious, I want to know who did you see. If they're all dead, then I start to think more along this line. Right. If it's bizarre, if, if they come along and they uh -huh. you know, were three feet tall and stuff like this, I'm thinking delirium. But when they're all dead people and they're not, there's nothing weird about it, Mm -hmm. I start to think that it may be more of the harbinger sign. So well, we've talked about the out of body experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've touched on the, the tunnel experience. Yeah, I do have a clip. It's a, a, a brief clip. Just several people talking about the tunnel experience. But uh, essentially, when people come out of their bodies, uh, sometimes immediately they go to the tunnel. Sometimes mm -hmm. after visiting, after, when they think about people that are mm -hmm. with them, sometimes after seeing relatives or dead relatives mm -hmm. or angels, then they go to the tunnel. Sometimes they skip the tunnel altogether. Most of the time, the tunnel experience comes before the light experience. Mm -hmm. The being so, of light? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Why don't you show us that clip and okay. then we'll, All right, let's, we'll let's pause after that. Sure. Yeah. After the other, they tell of a tunnel and an indescribable light. I couldn't stop it. I didn't know why I was moving. I was just pulled right through this enormous, infinite tunnel. As I see the tunnel, I'm down it. It happened so fast that I don't recall even a feeling about it other than just going extraordinarily rapidly down this tunnel. I went through darkness that was just so quick that there was nothing frightening about it. There was nothing scary about it. I couldn't even think about it because all of a sudden there was this light. I come into this place of brilliant, beautiful light. And it was as if the light drew me as a magnet. And it was not like any light that's on the earth, any colors like I've never seen. And, and they, I just can't describe them because there are no words for them. It's beyond technicolor. I um, saw a, it was a documentary with people from different languages. They did know each other, different parts of the world, uh, simultaneously describing the same type of event mm -hmm. and um, I just think that that is fascinating in yeah. itself that they have nothing in common except for that experience except for the death, and yeah. in their own culture in their own language in different parts of the world so how do you explain that well, it when, is, well, it, well you explain it by saying it, it's a real thing it's like falling it doesn't matter mm -hmm. whether you're Japanese or Mexican you jump out of an airplane the same thing happens to you yeah and I think that that it go that that really goes along with the idea that it's a real event, mm -hmm. that it's actually happening. Otherwise, if it was just in your head, it would be a subjective thing. Mm -hmm. And you'd see, a, I mean, why, why does everybody describe the being of light the same? Virtually every one of my patients that makes it all the way through the tunnel, because not everybody makes it all the way through. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of people make it to the tunnel and get sucked back into their bodies. Mm -hmm. and they never know what's at the end. They just mm -hmm. know there's a light way down there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Everybody who makes it all the way to the end of the tunnel, when they get to the light, they all say the same thing. Mm -hmm. The light is God doesn't matter whether they were agnostic or Buddhist or whatever before. When you get to the light, everybody will tell you mm -hmm. the light is God. End of discussion. How do you know? You just know. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to take a break. But before that, there are people watching now. And they know others that have had the experience. Mm -hmm. And they're hearing what you're saying about the, the different um, circumstances and stories that you're sharing about people who have had the experience. And they still don't believe. How? What do you say to those people? Oh, well, all I would say was that you know when you listen to these accounts, when you when you, I mean, really, YouTube is full of them. I don't think in this program we have to show a whole lot of clips. Mm -hmm. If somebody's really interested, right. mm -hmm. just you just go on YouTube and look at it. They're all it's all over the internet. Mm -hmm. People talk about this stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, and just and and also. Listen to your family members. Mm -hmm. This is really common. I have I have yet to go into an audience and talk about this. And again, this is not one of my big topics, but mm -hmm. when I do occasionally discuss it, there's always somebody in the audience mm -hmm. who's either had something, had this experience, or had an immediate family member who has. Mm -hmm. It's it's as common as dirt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't that. matter if if the if there's a religion, if it's Christianity, if it's Judaism, if it's Islam. Look, this near-death experiences don't address the topic of 
judgment and heaven and hereafter. It basically tells you after a person pops out of their body, what is the experience? That's it. Okay.